Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Lisa Cliff. I'm the Program Director of Better Futures Australia. And uh, I'd like to begin our gathering today by acknowledging we're all joining this call from First Nations land. For me in Mianjin, Brisbane, I'm on Yuggera and Turbul country uh, that I now have the pri privilege to call my home. And I wish to pay deep respects to elders past and present. And I'm thankful for their wisdom in looking after country so that we may continue to enjoy the benefits of their labours today. And may we live up to the example they have set in continuing to care for the country that we call home. I invite you all joining us to acknowledge all the various countries you're calling in from in the chat. Uh, before introducing our excellent panellists to get the conversation started, I'd like to share a quick introduction for those of you on the call that are new to Better Futures Australia. We're a two year old nonpartisan alliance involving climate champions from every sector of society and the economy. Finance, business, agriculture, health, social services, faith groups, researchers, think tanks, local, state and territory governments, First Nations unions and more, who are all calling for ambitious national targets and action and reimagining our future by demonstrating scalable climate solutions and success stories already underway. There's excellent work underway across Better Futures Australia's sector working groups uh, to use the first 100 days of the new Albanese government at the National Better Futures Forum, 15th and 16th of August in Canberra and also online, uh, to set an ambitious national climate agenda that will put us on track for climate resilient, zero emissions and better futures. So this policy dialogue is, is one of a series to start building out those critical conversations needed to see commitments to collaborative action plans uh, for a clear way forward for Australia. So details of that forum are taking shape now. Uh, Chloe, the amazing intern uh, with Better Futures Australia on the call today has uh, put the link in the chat. So please do uh, fill out that form and let us know any ideas you have to contribute, contribute to that, that event and make it, make it uh, impactful. So today we have three inspiring individuals joining us and a huge thank you to each of them for taking the time out of their busy days. We have Dr. Amanda Kale, uh, who recently finalized an amazing report outlining key interventions at a state and federal level to decarbonize Australia's regions and get us started. Uh, she'll get us started before we hear from the two other uh, stars on the call, Warwick Jordan and Wendy Farmer, both busy leading critical conversations in communities on the front line of Australia's energy transition. We'll then have around 20 minutes uh, for Q&A and discussion. So please do post your questions in the chat as we go. Uh, we're aiming to finish today's webinar at 1 p.m. Sydney time. Uh, so let's uh, hope we, we keep on time. Uh, and as mentioned, Chloe uh, on the call, uh, she'll be moderating the chat today and is working on a research report behind this conversation, looking into Gladstone and the Hunter Valley uh, as two examples uh, to learn from to inform Australia's transition for emissions intensive regions. So uh, we, we know that uh, out of the Glasgow COP last year, uh, the writing is on the wall and, and the world is finally starting to shift. There was a coalition of 190 countries and organizations committing at the Glasgow COP to phase out coal fired power and end support for new coal plants. And the recent IPCC report outlined policy recommendations for governments that highlighted the importance of engaging with impacted communities in developing nationally structured plans and just approaches to replace coal and other fossil fuel industries. And uh, you've all likely been following closely the, the media around AGL. And I'd, I'd just like to start this conversation today with a quote from Harriet Ke Kata, Carter that was in the uh, Guardian yesterday. So Harriet's from the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility. The bloodbath in the boardroom of AGL today was years in the making and well overdue. And I'd just like to add to Harriet's quote that clear plans for structured and just approaches to transition the emissions inten intensive industries and regions in Australia are also well overdue. So uh, this, this is such an important area for many engaging in the Better Futures Australia community, 
business leaders, investors, local governments, not-for-profits, community leaders and others really looking for ways that we can meaningfully contribute to driving a just transition. And that involves identifying ways we can work with the new Albanese government uh, to, to deliver clear pathways and some certainty for those communities. So to get us started on this discussion, we have Dr. Amanda Kale, CEO of The Next Economy. Amanda has spent over two decades working with inspiring people across Australia, Asia and the Pacific to create positive change on issues as diverse as economic development, public health, gender equality and climate adaptation. The focus of her work at The Next Economy is to support communities, government, industry and others to develop a more resilient, just and regenerative economy. Amanda has released The Next Economy's What Regions Need on the Path to Net Zero report that attracted a lot of well-deserved media interest. Amanda, so glad you can join us today. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm calling in um, from Yagara and Turrbal land um, and also recognise um, Wendy and Warwick for all the work that they have done over the years particularly Wendy, who's been in this for a really long time. And um, she was, we were very lucky to have her on the board of the Next Economy um, as well. Um, so I'm not going to talk, I'm only going to talk for a couple of minutes um, just to give you a bit of background. So for people who aren't familiar with the Next Economy, um, we do work all over Australia, mostly in fossil fuel, um, in regions with close economic ties to fossil fuels. In the last year, a lot of this work has been concentrated on central Queensland primarily, but we have also done some work in the Hunter Valley um, likely to do some work in the, well, starting some work in Latrobe Valley over the coming months. Um, also supporting some community, um, different groups, an alliance up in the Northern Territory, looking at um, alternative economic futures and the role that gas will or will not play in that. So the report came about because we're having these conversations with different groups all across um, Australia. And when I say different groups, it's um, a mix of all levels of government uh, and industry, primarily the, the main people who are asking us in to do this work, they're asking questions about as things change, how are they going to manage the changes in the energy sector? What does it mean for regional economic development? But we also generally will bring in unions, um, environment groups, traditional owners, other community interested community groups um, into different kinds of events to have these conversations. So different communities are at different stages in, the, in where they are about having this conversation acceptance of that change. But over that last year, we, we saw the same themes coming out. Like even though the ge geography was different, the issues were slightly different in different places, the stages of change that people were at was different, the same themes kept coming through. So we decided to write a report to share that because the stories we were hearing was very different to what we were hearing in the national media and increasingly from politicians over the last year. So very quickly, um, the first thing was that we noticed was the conversation has shifted dramatically in the last 12 months. So even 12 months ago, it was still seen as very politically risky to have a public conversation about what was happening, particularly in coal communities and particularly any conversation about the future of coal. People were quite happy to talk about renewable energy and what was happening in that space and the, the new economic opportunities that were starting to filter through, things like green hydrogen, green metals, other things that could be produced, renewable energy parts, opportunities in land use. Um, but nobody wanted to talk about managing the phase out of fossil fuels. We noticed that that really shifted in the second half of the year and increasingly towards the COP um, in Glasgow at the end of the year. And I think that the things that were really fueling that shift in the conversation was partly communities really starting to see the impacts that change is already here. This is not something off in the future. We heard a number of announcements of early closure notices for a number of power plants um, in the Hunter and Latrobe. Um, we also have heard our trading partners increase their, um, their emissions ambitions, which was actually, you know, people in central Queensland were actually talking about what that means for future trade. Um, and we were seeing thermal coal mines approved, but not actually financed. So that's still happening. So even though the price of coal has increased, we're not, we haven't the first time seen sort of the price increase and then the supply increase at the same rate. And in some places, the thermal, um, the rate of production of thermal coal hasn't actually increased at all since the price has gone up. So these are all signs on the ground that things are changing. And people are also curious about how they can take advantage of emerging economic opportunities. So that was the first thing, the conversation has shifted and people are really crying out for more leadership like and government to, to play a more proactive role. Second thing is that the noticing how much is happening and mostly led by local governments and industry players, but also how there's a big gap around um, really coordinated action and also planning that was really focusing on 
the transition as a regional economic development issue. So people were sort of taking bits of the pieces of the pie. So they're talking about energy security over here. Maybe they're talking about workers over there. Industry is trying to get investment. But we re there's so many different pieces to this, including environmental impacts, how community is going to benefit, how do we diversify the regional economy, how do we make sure that the jobs are good jobs and are actually not just looking after fossil fuel workers, but also people who've been excluded from the economy, women, First Nations people, young people, long-term unemployed people. So we need to be approaching this a lot more holistically, and that means we need um, better structures around planning that's more inclusive. So there was a lot of interest in establishing transition authorities. Um, in some regions, we already have transition authorities. Like we've now got the Hunter Expert Panel, we've got the Latrobe Valley Authority, got the Collegiate Delivery Unit. But these, uh, the regional work really needs to be supported at the state and federal level. So there's growing calls for a national transition authority that also has policy frameworks that are consistent, that have targets that are meaningful and keep up with the rest of the world around emissions reductions and renewable energy expansion. Um, and, and then the structures and the funding to support that. So just to finish off, the, the theme that really surprised me the most was um, kind of questions about what the role of government is in all of this. We can't just leave it to industry and technology, um, but also questions about democracy and how do we manage massive change as things move forward? Because there's a lot of issues around resilience that are not just the energy transition that people are really questioning. They can see all these kind of waves that are coming and they're saying, how do we get more resilient? What's the role of community? How do we hold government to account? How do we make sure that industry aren't the only ones that benefit from this? So some interesting questions around democracy and I will leave it there. Thank you, Amanda, that was really great. And yeah, you're so right in that, yeah, it's a, it all comes back to the role of democracy and how we manage change and uh, be active in uh, what the government's response is. So thank you for that. Uh, I now have the, the pleasure to introduce Warwick Jordan. Uh, fun fact about Warwick is he once rode a horse across Costa Rica. Uh, so a long story for another day. And Warwick is the coordinator of the Hunter Jobs Alliance, which I'm sure many of you on the call are well aware of. Uh, and he is a union and community environment alliance um, Oh, sorry, the Hunter Jobs Alliance is a union and community environment alliance focused on supporting communities through structural change in energy and related industries in the Hunter region. Warwick has worked on conservation, resource management and regional economic change issues for the past 20 years. Thanks so much for joining us today, Warwick. Thanks, Lisa. Um, also, thanks for sharing my LinkedIn profile. The photo is absolutely shocking. So. Uh, I do need to update that. Look, thanks, guys. Really appreciate the opportunity um, to be on today. Uh, certainly support a lot of the comments Amanda's made there around uh, where we're at, at at this point in time. Um, I'd say certainly there has been uh, sentiment shifts in our part of the world in the Hunter where there's a, a recognition that something is changing and, and that something needs to be done about it. There's a widespread of opinion around that, about why it's happening, whether it should be happening, what's the nature of the opportunity and so on. But notwithstanding that there, there has been a recognition that things are moving, there's a set of challenges that go with that. And there's also a set of opportunities um, as well. And that was what I was primarily keen to talk about today is we have we appear to have moved fairly rapidly from um, from a, a view and a lot of questioning about how significant are these problems that we're talking about in our regional economy or how re how real are some of the new opportunities and I think we've moved pretty quickly from questions about that and I'm talking literally in a six month period that you can see inside the hunter where now there is a recognition of necessity, but also particularly opportunity about what comes next. But I think as soon as we collectively identified that, uh, yes, some of these opportunities aren't pie in the sky. Um, now these opportunities are actually absolutely necessary for our, our industrial and energy base and the jobs that go with that. But also, um, you know, it was probably a, a couple of week period where we were thinking that way and then people started realizing, well, actually we need to move really, really quickly. 
to be able to grab these opportunities because it, it's highly competitive. Any any region in the world essentially that has industrial capability, the right type of infrastructure uh, in a lot of places, necessary drivers around um, moving away from traditional commodity export uh, industries or around fossil fuels. Um, they're all looking to try and get ahead of the game here. And so it's incredibly competitive and that comes on top of the competitive pressures that we've seen pile on our, our manufacturing and industrial sectors due to changes in, in trade and, and the global economy over a long time. So um, essentially there's a recognition that there's a, probably a fairly limited window. You know, the show won't stop if we don't grab these opportunities, but we will be missing out on something that can uh, make a, a contribution to our economy. It's not, a, you know, it's not a conversation about a, you know, straight, straight move from one sector, whether that's power generation or, or mining or what have you, straight into something else. But it is a conversation about how we create those opportunities in the economy um, for current generations of workers, but particularly the next generation as, as well. And I think we're in a really good point in time. I think we have the opportunity where that community sentiment is recognising opportunity. The Hunter's particularly interesting on that front because even though our community uh, culture and our, our politics has a lot of the same um, complex things going on with you know people being anxious about the state of the economy, the future uh, of what's going on, we also have a very optimistic community here. And I think in some ways that is, it's not unique, but it is notably different to some other parts of the country. I think we, we have rolled with um, changes that have been really difficult in our economy, um, but it's also just a bloody fantastic place to live and work and raise a family. And so I think people are, are optimistic um, about our own capacity. The opportunity that we have at the moment is uh, we have momentum from employers and, and business, including larger companies that are starting to dive into new projects. And a lot of it is very early doors at this stage, but it's turned from a, uh, is this really happening conversation to things are starting and we can see the first steps being in place um, when you have large businesses and investors um, putting their money where their mouth is to try and stimulate new opportunities, that sends a really clear signal. Um, at a state government level, um, we're starting to see more efforts in areas that are directly relevant. Um, there's a substantial, a billion dollar uh, net zero industry and innovation program that the state government is running, which is focused on Newcastle and Hunter and Wollongong, um, which is all about stimulating uh, activity, um, both in terms of supporting large employers like smelters or um, ammonium nitrate factories to decarbonise, as well as attracting renewable components, manufacturing or hydrogen or other, uh, other related new industry sectors. And so that the, the framework is there and, and the, the dollars have been put down to do that. Um, and then thirdly, we also obviously have a, a world of opportunity now where um, we have a brand new federal government that has more of a direct focus on how we back manufacturing in really practical ways with some serious public investment in the right places. Um, we have a focus on things like the Powering the Region uh, Regions Fund, which is a, a serious amount of funding that should really start helping us through um, how we attract, stimulate, grow um, some of our opportunities here. Um, and I think some of those um, some of those initiatives are incredibly well timed. Um, maybe they would have been well timed a fair while ago, but um, we're at a moment now where we have um, a, a landing point as far as community support. It is definitely fragile. Like I, I think it would be a, a big mistake to assume that you know, whether it's the Hunter or, or wherever, um, you know, that now we're all rolling with net zero and everyone's an environmentalist and, and so on. It's not what it's like. It's fragile and people need to see progress. Um, but I think we have 
the shape of the right type of policy and the right type of approach from um, some parts of the business community that we can start moving now. I'd say the last thing that is really critical and we, we cannot underestimate this. Um, all of this whole show is predicated on ensuring that we have an energy system that is going to be able to support industry, support heavy industry. And, you know, there's, there's everything from supply chain bottlenecks to um, community concern about expansion of renewable energy and transmission lines in particular places. And I think, yeah, you know, we need collectively to, to take a view of that where, you know, the objectives are probably different to what they would be if you were just coming at it from an industry point of view and different as to if you were just coming at it from an environmental point of view. There's a, there's a complicated uh, issue to manage there where it's not necessarily about um, doing everything at breakneck pace to be able to meet these needs. Um, but we also need to be moving incredibly quickly. Otherwise, we will not have the power supplies that are required to do what we need to do. At the same time, um, you know, from, from the environmental point of view, um, you know, it's not about necessarily uh, preventing project X or Y getting up, but it is about putting a large amount of expectation on about how these projects are developed and what's done so that we don't have environmental collateral damage and that the social benefits are really clear. But I think we need to think about it as both objectives, not, not as one or the other, because we will run into difficulties on one side or another um, if there's environmental damage or the social and economic expectations are oversold and aren't met. And we'll have a, a similar problem in terms of our economies and our emissions reductions if we run into serious challenges about how, how many renewables have been put in and, and how that's been managed. So, you know, I think that's one to keep a firm eye on. There's no easy answers there, but it's really important to be thinking about um, all sides of the equation there. Uh, and that's, that's it for me. And I think just to jump in on a question there, um, so Eli, that um, program that I mentioned, the New South Wales government level, um, the overarching program is called the Net Zero Industry and Innovation Fund. Um, but there's, there's a few different moving parts under that, including uh, a clean manufacturing precincts uh, program, which is, is one of the, the early stage uh, initiatives that's rolling out. Thanks so much, Warwick. Uh, so yeah, inspiring just hearing about the work underway in the Hunter Valley and yeah, just how you described it as an awesome place to live and work. So those in the community will, yeah, be passionate about creating uh, the, the systems changes that are needed and making it work. So and yeah, as you mentioned with the, the new government on board and new announcements, um, hopefully we can get that uh, from uh, the, the triple bottom line as you were talking about there with social, environmental and economic all, all at the forefront in uh, hopefully what is a community driven approach there. So uh, third uh, speaker today, the excellent Wendy Farmer, uh, who was born in the township of Yalon. So the hospital she was born in is now uh, no longer, but uh, in an open cut mine. So that's uh, that's a bit of a shame to, to have that lost history there in, in an open uh, coal pit. Uh, Wendy Farmer is the president of Voices of the Valley, a community advocacy group that formed during the catastrophic 2014 Hazelwood Brown Coal Mine Fire in Victoria. Uh, passionate about working towards a just transition for the Latrobe Valley and other communities, Wendy is a dedicated campaigner and media spokesperson, and uh, it's a real privilege to have Wendy here to share insights with us today. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. And it's great to call in from Gunnokurno country in Latrobe Valley. Um, Latrobe Valley, bottom of Victoria, just before Tasmania, a little bit of water between us if you're trying to put where we are. Um, Latrobe Valley has been um, Victoria's power source for the last 90 years and um, produced all power from brown coal, of course, a little bit of gas. Um, but things are changing and the community are starting to learn that it's changing. The transition's definitely happening. And when you look at the different projects that are 
happening across the whole of Latrobe Valley and Gippsland. So I'll bring it out broader because it's not just a couple of little towns, but it's quite a way across. We've got lots of different projects happening. We've got lots of people in the field of renewable energy and what can happen in our communities <clears throat> across the east coast of Victoria. It's quite exciting to see the conversation continue about renewable energy, the opportunities that we have and that we can also create. What's really interesting is that the power station operators also want to be in that conversation. They actually want to tell the story that energy is changing. And it's been, I think that's come across because community and you know myself included have actually been speaking to them to say, you have a duty to speak to the community about what is happening, about the transition that's happening, not only for your workers and talking to them, but the whole community. When you live in a coal community, um, you know, for 90 years, the history of this community is a lot of people migrated here to work in the coal industry. So they believe the coal industry, the coal industry, I, Amanda would have heard me call it, they're the family. We talk good about the family. We don't want to talk against the family. We trust them. You know, we trust mum and dad. We trust Mr. Cole um, Power Station. So they have a duty to speak to their workers and communities. They have been speaking to their workers and their workers are on board for change. They're happy for change, but they want to make sure that it works with them as well and it works for their community. In the 90s, our um, energy was privatised and our community was really hurt. A lot of fear was built in the community and that fear still consists. It's like an open sore that has never really healed. So when we talk about transition in this community, it's about how do we look at the bigger picture and take people on a journey. I don't ever talk about we're moving away from coal. I talk we're, we're moving to new energies. We're moving to that new economy that is before us with all these opportunities. Um, of course, we still have a very split community. We'll have some that actually appreciate that things are changing. It must change. They're happy with that. And then there will be others that, well, we won't have any lights. What? We're not going to have any lights. It's just not going to work, you know. Um, so that conversation is still a very mixed conversation. I'm not going to say it's all happy, rosy, and we're all, you know, in la-la land because it's not. And there's still a lot of work to do because when you have that conflict, there's all the, also that confusion. But what we did see in the federal government is throw that con confusion in. And I am going to take it back to the federal government because while the previous government sat at the table with pieces of coal and supported the coal industry like they did, they actually forgot that there were real people and real communities out there. We haven't seen any support at all from the Fed. Well, I shouldn't say any, very minor support from the federal government in previous years for a transition for Latrobe Valley. Yet we had the Hazelwood closure, which was a five month closure. It hurt the community, but we bounced back really fast because we other things were instigated. But we didn't see the federal government support that. In fact, we saw the federal government talk about energy insecurity. We saw all sorts of things really confused in that market. And, you know, the lights are going to go off. And if we have a just transition, well, who's that going to just transition for? Or, you know, it's not going to look after our workers. So I'm looking forward to this Albanese government actually standing up and supporting coal communities right across Australia with that transition. But not just standing in Parliament saying, well, what are we going to do and deciding what we're doing, but working with those communities on the ground that are smart communities to make sure that we transition in a just and fair way, not just for workers, but for communities, businesses, industries, anybody in those communities and for the future of our planet. And that's acting on climate change. So I think Anthony Albanese has got a challenge, but he also has opportunities himself to actually start coming to regional areas and putting his money where his mouth is to support these communities. Because when we look at all regional communities across Australia, they have usually built the cities of the states. Without these regions, those, those big cities would not be. Um, you know, we are doing things differently. We are having a drive of the community push for what we need. Communities are sick of being told what is good for them. We want to have a voice.
we want to have a say and we actually can imagine what we're going to have. I think that um, you touched on the AGLD merger. It was a great thing that it was um, canned at the last minute or, you know, stopped on Friday night because that wasn't going to support regional communities that have got AGL there at the moment. In fact, it was, there was a risk that it could have left our communities even more vulnerable. It could have left us in fear. So it was a decision once again made by international board that they were going to do a demerger. They didn't speak to the community. So how will these sort of industries do it differently to make sure they don't make these mistakes again? Um, we need to, as you know, advocates for, for renewable energy and as we transition, I think the biggest part is we need to tell the stories. We need to tell the stories of the good things that are happening, the projects that are happening, what the future is of energy and how it will work. We've got to stop this it won't work, but how does it work? What do we need? And, you know, as we go along that journey and we find little speed humps, we fix the speed humps. We actually build the technology or the, you know, infrastructure that we need to continue on the journey of the transition of energy. Um, I'll leave it at that. That was great. Thanks so much, Wendy. A great way to wrap the introductions there. What do we need to make it work? And uh, a number of questions coming in from those on the call. And that's just the perfect segue there. So first question uh, from Chloe, which uh, has a few links to questions from uh, Joshua and uh, James as well. Uh, so if you could identify one key ask for the Albanese government to help uh, or provide support for a just and tra timely transition for coal reliant and trade exposed communities, what would that ask be? And the, the similar points raised uh, by Joshua, what role do you see state governments and or regional authorities taking in removing barriers uh, towards building the energy infrastructure needed for the transition in these regions? Is it mostly a matter of funding? So yeah, just to, I feel like there's a, a link there in um, the, the ask for the Albanese government and what support is needed. And yeah, Wendy, how you finished up there was a nice segue. So if you'd like to start on that. I'm um, sure, look, if I have a ask, it would probably be to speak with regional communities and fund them you know, really sit down and look at what needs to be done instead of that, just that fine layer of what needs to be done. Because a proper transition to happen does need proper funding. It does, you know, I'm all in support of an Australia-wide transition authority to actually really, you know, put, put all the little bits, connect all the little pieces together. Because I think sometimes they don't get connected. Um, but, you know, it has to be with, good strong reasonable people on that board as well we don't want a um gas cartel to actually run the transition authority to you know um so i think really communities need certainty they need plans and all levels of government so in that other part of the question need to work together to make sure that they have the plans are there and the certainty is there for communities to move forward and that's when we will see the investment really increase. Thanks, Wendy. Inspirational. Uh, Amanda, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it needs to be somebody's job. Um, so I really agree with Wendy around the need for a nation national transition authority, but it has to be, their, their mandate has to be really clear that their job is to coordinate across all of the different aspects of this. Um, they need to have integrity. They can't be political appointments. Um, this needs to be people who would have the right experience and knowledge around how do we support regions to manage change, which we haven't done very well in Australia. So we don't have a lot of um, examples to point to, but there are some. Um, and when I say all aspects of this, um, there's a question about energy. Um, there's plenty of funding now around transmission. Um, there's a lot of private money that's now moving into renewables and to manufacturing. The, the thing that I hear from industry, though, is that they're actually limited in how much they can talk to each other. It's not their job to build the infrastructure that they're all going to benefit from. It's not their job to come up with a regional plan. Um, it's not their job to, you know, do the modelling around how much energy is needed into the future. So there's energy security, affordability, access. There's how do we look after workers, but it can't just be limited to workers and fossil fuels. It's how do we help existing industry to adapt? So the big companies like Rio Tinto that are decarbonising, how do we support them? How do we diversify other sectors? What's the work we need to do to reduce and absorb emissions across all sectors? 
Um, how do we make sure we maintain healthy land and water through this? And how do we make sure that the community actually benefits? And just going back to the point that Warwick was talking about, we're already seeing negative impacts on communities around things like conflicts arising around land use, um, around cultural heritage sites, around water. Um, we're not seeing renewable energy companies do the right kind of consultation that fossil fuel companies have been doing in the past. We haven't seen financial commitments around how that money is going to come back to communities. All of these different things at the moment sit across all different levels of government and across different government departments and across different industries. So somebody needs to sit in the middle of that and bring all these pieces together and do that planning coordination across different levels, but really place-based work as well. And we should build on the existing infrastructure, um, institutions that are already there in place and set up new ones in places where they don't exist like Queensland. So we've got that coordination across regional and that's where the work is, but state and federal governments are supporting that with the right policy frameworks, the right targets um, and the right funding mechanisms to make it happen. Excellent, thanks Amanda. And I just uh, added a link in the chat there, sorry, the second time lucky uh, to the ACTU proposal for the Just Transition Authority that um, James James Willen shared there. Uh, Warwick, what, what would you like to add to this uh, response? Yeah, look, I, I think, um... I think it starts to become a, a more detailed policy question about what works best where. Um, you know, there's there's obviously now a, a greater level of appetite at the federal government level for um, dealing with the specific planks that are required around dealing with the transition, uh, whether that's manufacturing investment, uh, whether that's training um, through TAFE, um, whether that's the renewable energy side of things, um, you know, that it's really important. And I think we have um, some of those pieces in place. I think when you're talking about structural change authorities, it's really important to recognise, as the other guys have said, what's the regional dynamics and realities? Um, and also just looking at our federation structure as well. I think there is actually not a great history of, the federal government looking to dive in to regional areas. Um, you know, I know there's different views on this, but um, Regional Development Australia has had a sort of pretty rocky history around how it works in particular places. And that's a sort of, it's different, but it's sort of an analog to look at. Um, but I think, um, you know, in a lot of ways, state government auspiced authorities are closer to the action because state governments have direct responsibility for most of the relevant policy areas and just have a lot more arms and legs on the ground. Um, so I think that's the, the sort of priority model. That said though, um, you know, the federal government, the Commonwealth has a critical role to play here. And I think it's a matter of looking at um, what would be accepted by communities. You know, what are they familiar with in terms of um, government and, and what levels of government are they more familiar working with um, and and what are the things that a Commonwealth government that's being active and, and actually recognising these these challenges brings to the table. You know, there, there's always certainly a role for um, providing that funding that is directed into really specific program areas. Um, I think the setting the policy frameworks and the expectations that you know, we are going to take these things seriously, whether it's training, whether it's local content, um, whether it's making sure um, things are being done on the ground is really critical. So there's a, a policy setting. And then I also think the um, the the grant, the thinking work, the, the grant that comes out of a federal public service that can say, look, this is how you do it. We've seen that before with um, Department of Industry is a good example where, um, you know, we've had structural changes in other industries and at the end of the day, you probably end up with your state governments, uh, you know, with your unions, with um, the companies themselves doing a lot of the legwork. Um, but what the federal government does is creates expectation, provides expertise around what good looks like and sets that frame. And so I think, you know, regardless of what might roll out, um, I think just thinking really carefully about that policy design. Um, and I also think regardless of whether those kind of proposals are going to roll out, now we have a hell of a lot to work with in terms of uh, reconstruction fund, powering the regions fund, um, TAFE and others. So I think that coordination is really important, but there's also just plenty of stuff we need to get on with and make use of in, in regional areas, um, you know, as of, you know, as of today. 
Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Warwick. Uh, so a couple of questions there that uh, also follow on nicely from how you wrapped up those comments. Uh, so we've got a question uh, around um, the Hunter and other regions, if we bring back manufacturing to Australia as part of the transition to other opportunities and really create a diverse and, and thriving industry, will our labour costs be able to compete with overseas imports? And then a follow-up question from Serena uh, that's also related to that. Does Australia have the skills for the transition coordination just outlined um, uh, by Amanda? And then what you were saying uh, towards the end there, Warwick, about the, the TAFE and other programs that are needed for setting expectations of what the future holds. So maybe we'll start with Warwick, then Amanda, and then Wendy. Thanks. Yeah, look, I there's other high wage economies who have made a choice to uh, have industry policy to encourage that kind of development. Um, and there's a lot of things that we just don't do here and haven't for a fair while that, that we need to, um, you know, I think as a, as a country, we, well, we is probably stretching it, but there was a decision more or less made about 25, 30 years ago that, we were going to push our chips in on a commodity export compar comparative advantage based economy. And, you know, there's an element of logic to that, right? You look at our standard of living, you, you look at, um, at how we live and, and our prosperity. And so you can understand that. That also um, creates part, a set of vulnerabilities in the economy, but it also means that we can become weakened in other things that we are actually quite good at. And I think there, there are some fundamentals like, you know, we we have we spend um, half as much per capita on R and D as Latvia, for example. You know, um, we're eighty seventh on the World Index of Economic Complexity, like just after Botswana. You know, there's um, and not casting slights on those countries, but you know where where we sit in our level of development means we should be doing more. And so, but yes, it makes it challenging in a high wage country. There's things that other places will have an advantage on because they pay their people less. But, it, you know, is that the type of country we want? And there's other places we can look around the world that put a lot more effort into this and have made the choice. And now I think in a world where I think we should all be very aware of how consequential what's going on in global supply chains is now. It, it's not just a flash in the pan um, that will create some choke points in terms of how, how we run, what we do and what we buy. Um, it, it's actually going to be an enduring state of affairs for a while and, and will be a huge constraint. Um, but that's, a, you know, it's also an opportunity to make some, make some decisions and it, you know, it might impact our productivity. It might impact some other things, but um, it, it's going to create a lot of opportunity. If we get it right, then there's more jobs. We should be more productive um, and, and there's no reason why we can't do it and focus on the things that we're going to be good at. I'm going to jump in. Yeah, um, yeah. Just adding to that, um, I think we're in a different situation to say in the past in terms of labour costs not being as substantial input into um, things like manufacturing as they have been in past decades. So we're looking at now. You're looking most manufacturing is we're looking at automation. We're looking at a different skill set, plus lower cost of energy. Um, and having more materials locally available means that we can be competitive in a way that we haven't been before. The other factor to put in this, which um, Warwick was just touching on, is if you look at the scale of the renewable energy that we need to roll out in the next couple of years, we can actually build a domestic manufacturing that actually meets domestic demand. Like it's crazy the amount of stuff that we need and we've actually got the materials here if we want to make them. Um, then you throw in the supply chain issues and the expenses around that and the expenses around fuel to actually bring it in from outside. So it becomes a much more competitive um, and more attractive um, opportunity for investors. So we're in a more competitive space than we have been ever before around the manufacturing side of things. Um, but on terms of the skills, do we have the skills for something like the transition authority? We probably don't have the model right, but there's plenty of other countries that have been a bit further along that we can look at. We actually know what we need to do. Like I think we talk about it becomes this very big complex thing. It's actually not, it's a planning thing. And there are lots of very smart planners in Australia, but it is going to take, uh, require some political courage to make it work um, and leadership and some very 
savvy, politically savvy people to, to make it work as well. It's not going to be straight. The politics of it makes it hard. The people side of it makes it hard. But the skill set, what you need to do around regional planning is, is not so much. I think what we're dealing with, though, and there's bigger questions here, bigger philosophical questions, um, about how we go about this because they're kind of big worldviews and paradigms sitting behind how we approach the problem in the first place. With the previous government, it was kind of that neoliberal, it's a technological, we'll just throw money at it and industry will take it and run with it. We're now talking about, well, what's the role of government? There's big questions around what's the role the government can play in supporting regions. But there's also a big question about, given the external shocks that are going to continue to come down the line on regional areas and how we've seen that played out, even with the floods recently um, and supply chain issues, I think there's a question around how do we make regions more resilient? So what are the things that regions need to lead on and how do we build the capacity and the institutions at a local level to think forward around how we build economies, but also how do we build resilience and how do we organise differently? So this, I think there's space for innovation in the social aspects of this around decision-making, leadership, strengthening local government, um, which I hope is a conversation we can have as we tackle these issues. Um, and I'm just going to build on what Amanda said about that um, local manufacturer and that. So just to, just as an example, so uh, for Gippsland, we've had three proposals for offshore wind farms. You know, they, they're going to need a lot of different um, technologies, lots of different things built, manufactured, maintained, um, that why wouldn't you try and build an, a... Um, industry around that to actually manufacture rather than as Amanda said try and import it and pay you know you've got your waiting times you've got your um fuel you've got everything else associated with that so I think if we're smart and we plan smart when we do um developments we should be able to manufacture as well and especially you know one of the biggest costs of manufacturing so we have an Australian paper here they always say that their gas is their um, biggest cost in manufacturing. So if these um, industries can actually use renewable energy to actually manufacture, we've already reduced that cost. We, we can manufacture here. We have the skills in Australia to do it. And, we, and if we don't, we have the smarts to be able to learn how to do it. And I think that's, you know, um, with the transition um, coordination, I think, once again, we have the smarts to do it. Yes, we may look outside, but it's also good. It's great to look outside your box and then, you know, really build on what you've got rather than be very isolated anyway. So we can do it. It's just a matter of going, we're ready to do it. Thanks, Wendy, and thanks, Amanda and Warwick. Some great answers there. And uh, yes, Serena in the chat sharing that too. Uh, it's, it's amazing to have this opportunity to pick uh, all three of your brains uh, during this webinar. Uh, so just a, a follow-up question, which Amanda has answered in the chat, if any of you would like to add to that um, from Eli Court, what would you say are the most comparable but exemplar high wage economies that are doing uh, Doing the manufacturing and the renewable energy transition uh, so that's that's one and then another question from fiona uh, we've got about five minutes uh before we'll before we'll wrap uh to to get you all off to everything else on on your desk today i'm sure uh so did the carbon tax deal uh, provide any lessons uh on reducing negative effects uh so a question from fiona there which uh is could probably be interpreted in lots of ways, but I'll, I'll leave that uh, to each of you. So, uh, Wendy, would you like to, to start us off and then we'll go to Amanda and Warwick. So are we talking about the removal of the carbon taxes that we had or? Yeah, yeah. So and I, I think just a general, you know, what can we learn from uh, negative uh, fallout from past approaches from federal governments in Australia? That's probably. <laughs> Look, so in, in going back to that carbon, um, Re reduction of tax. We actually found as we watched in um, Latrobe Valley that their air pollution increased when we removed the carbon tax. Um, companies were doing things sneakily as well that, you know, we knew when um, the local EP or the EPA were monitoring and there was a set time that they monitored every day. Therefore, if you wanted to actually emit 
um, extra, you would throw it at different times of night. Yes, it is true, Amanda, they did do that. They've changed that since um, it was taken to their attention. So I think, you know, in all of those things, we once again, we have to be smart, but we actually have to look at um, how do we reduce pollution? How do we actually improve the health of local communities and especially in regional areas that actually bear most of the cost of health um, when it comes to air pollution or water or any sort of pollution um, and we should actually have a cost on that to stop people doing it. I'll jump, jump in there really quickly. Um, something that's been surprising that's come out of closed door workshops with industry have been the number of industry players who've advocated for a carbon price <laughs> and other um, thinking it's not going to happen. But they're saying that they are already, fact the big companies at least, are already factoring in um, a car the introduction of a carbon price at some point into their forecasting and their budgets. Um, and whether that's happening by, you know, something that the Australian government does or it's the cost is going to come through through things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So taxes put on commodities from countries that aren't doing enough to reduce emissions or high carbon products. So they're saying that that cost is going to come in either way. The question is whether or not, you know, if we did it in Australia, we captured that revenue, which was what was used to set up the, C, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation arena, which is that income that we've lost. And industry said that was really important as a revenue started to kick things off. 10 years ago. Yeah, look, I would pro I'd say I'll probably go a little bit more niche on that. I think probably two things that are worthwhile paying attention to. Um, you know, we, we all benefited from a tax cut um, as part of um, a clean energy package that was put together. And I, I think that's worth reflecting on as far as, um, you know, sometimes the things that provide the benefit aren't necessarily directly tied into the issue at hand. And there's, you know, there's other ways that things can be done. And so I think it's worthwhile um, remembering that there's more than one way to skin a cat in terms of providing support for people in those situations. I think the other thing, and Wendy, you probably closer to the action on this, but, um, you know, I think to that question earlier um, about authorities and and the like, um, you know, I think there's probably some salutary lessons in some of the efforts at multi-level governance that went on um, in Gippsland in particular around the clean energy package in that um, there was a, you know, a notional sort of right structure around governance um, to try and deal with um, some of the, the implications of the clean energy um, package. And there was efforts to bring state and federal government together, but um, uh, as far as rollout, it, it certainly suffered from um, disagreements between um, state and federal governments. It suffered from uh, issues of uh, essentially funding being directed out of the communities that were uh, going to be directly impacted by the policy to neighbouring communities ostensibly for political reasons. And so that sort of undermined the integrity of it and then also um, as far as what I understand was the, the operation and it wasn't it wasn't something that lasted a long time because the, the policy got removed but um, there there was a, a need for a greater level of, of participation inside the, the community to make um, those kind of multi-level governance approaches fly and you know I think I, I, like I think we should always take care that there is you know, there is a need for someone to be sitting around a table and there is a need for those people to have some time and space to work through things. Um, and that's really critical. But at, at the same time, they need to be plugged into mechanisms where the community can have a say so that um, the people who are, are put in those positions to make those decisions on behalf of the community or provide advice um, are, are tap, you know, tapped informally to what's going on um, in the community and there's that level of transparency. So that, that'd probably be two you know, fairly sort of uh, niche areas that I'd, I'd point out as far as um, what we might be able to learn from that, that experience. Can I just um, quickly jump in on there? Um, so if you're talking about the clean energy package or the transition centre that was um, put there, 
with the um, closure of Hazelwood. You know, when we look at that, it was a very rushed decision. It was actually a community plan that was implemented at the particular time because the government really didn't know what to do. Um, but one of the things that it was to do was to create innovation, to actually have people thinking about things that um, and how to do it different, which I think is really important. Sometimes we look at things and we just want it to work 100% unless otherwise it's a failure. But without failure, we actually don't learn. So the Innovation Centre, sorry, the um, Transition Centre as such has, in my books, would I would class has been a success because it's actually built this community stronger and it's actually given great ideas. And we have more employment or more people employed now than we did before Hazelwood closed. And I think that's really important because that didn't happen in privatisation. Oh, and Wendy, just to clarify too, uh... I was talking more of that 2012-13 um, period around the, the Gillard government clean energy package, the, the work you know, that's been done uh, around the worker transition centre in, in Gippsland has been fantastic. Uh, I was talking more about some of the, the previous history. I'm sorry, and I don't have any history between 2014 when I went, oh, my God, I have to do something. <laughs> Thank you all. We've got uh, two minutes left, so I'll, I'll uh, wrap up this uh, conversation today, but definitely excited uh, to continue building on this and all of the insights you've shared. So thank you, Amanda, Warwick and Wendy. You've offered glimpses to everyone on the call and those that will watch the recording and what we feed into the forum asks for the new Albanese government to, to what a better future for emissions intensive trade exposed industries and regions across Australia could look like, how they can uh, work with the new government to actualize a just transition for their communities. Uh, and you've each highlighted that as a country, we have choices we can make today and an opportunity to put us on that 1.5 trajectory. Uh, and yeah, lots of great examples shared from other areas overseas and other regions where uh, positive uh, things are already well underway. So really looking forward to, yeah, how, how much more we can pick out of those amazing brains of yours to really put uh, the Albanese government on the right path and see some collaborative action plans implemented for the next term of government and beyond. So please do everybody jump in to the Better Futures Forum website, submit an expression of interest to have your ideas on the program. I know Amanda will be running some sessions there, which I'm super excited for. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to be involved in the society and economy wide approach to realizing our zero emissions futures, please do reach out, contact at betterfutures.org.au. And yeah, thank you so much, Wendy, Amanda, Warwick, for all you're doing to create better zero emissions futures for us all. Can I add my fun fact before everyone goes? <laughs> please. <laughs> my surname is, Sorry, is pronounced Carl. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Also, I dressed up as a sheep once for fundraising purposes, if that's not as exciting as how to pronounce my surname. Thanks, Amanda. It's uh, better late than never for me on that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All You're right. not alone, Lisa. Thanks, <laughs> See ya. All right. Catch ya.